Hey, what's going on? Look who we got. It's Rob Morgan. You're watching The Sit Down on DJ Sixsmith. He's got his brand new movie, Just Mercy. What's up, man? Good hey, to meet you. Hey, man. Like the guys to meet you. Happy to meet you, brother. Thank How's you everything going? Me. Blessed, man. Blessed and groovy. A Wednesday morning, you know. No, it's Tuesday morning. It's a Tuesday? It's a Wednesday. Yeah, it's, it's Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. It's what? See, happy new decade, man. <laughs> new See, year, I'm, new decade. We see, still don't know what day it is. Sorry, we'll get to it. We'll get there. I'll catch up. But yeah, man, I'm just happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Of man. course. Well, the yeah. big day is Friday when this goes everywhere. This has yes. been out. People have seen it. But this is a really special one. Like, you've done a lot of weighty movies, really important movies. But what spoke to you about this character in this film? Man, so many things spoke to me about this character. Uh, one, just the brilliant book that Brian Stevenson wrote, mm -hmm. Just Mercy, uh, self-titled, like the movie. Um, the importance of giving voice to these voiceless characters, like Brian Stevenson is doing with the work that he's doing with the Equal Justice Initiative mm -hmm. Program to exonerate uh, wrongfully convicted uh, people on death row. Uh, to be a part of something like that that could potentially affect positive change and start a, a conversation where we start to uh, critically look at our justice system and see if it's really promoting justice or if it's really predicating on a particular group of people. Uh, to use my artist and my vision and my voice and talents to work with uh, our director, uh, Destin Daniel Cretton, um, was a no-brainer to work with the phenomenal co-stars I had, like Michael B. Jordan, Jamie Foxx, mm -hmm. Brie Larson, O'Shea Jackson Jr., Tim Blake Nelson, mm -hmm. Karan Kendrick. Amazing cast. I mean, yeah. an amazing cast, man. It was like a, a no-brainer. And um, when I particularly read Herbert in the script, I felt the uh, beautiful responsibility of being the guy to position this character in America's living room. Mm. So we have this character, Herbert Richardson, young man who basically, before he had his own, his first girlfriend, gets shipped off to war. See, his whole platoon gets blown up. He's the only one survived, fought for this country's freedom, come back to the country with little to no uh, uh, emotional, mental support to include him back into society. So uh, he meets a young lady, falls in love. Her and her family out of nowhere moves to Alabama. Mm. In his mind, to communicate his love, he's trained in the language of war. So what does he do? He goes to Alabama thinking if he places a bomb by her house and it detonates, he'll swoop in and save her and she'll be the love of his life. But unfortunately, a young girl, uh, two young girls picked up the package and one of them, one of them lost their lives. Mm. So uh, to have the opportunity to give voice to that kind of character so that it could be in our faces and ask ourselves, is anybody uh, worthy of that kind of punishment, I felt was a, a, a beautiful opportunity. Yeah, I mean, that's a really specific character, a really specific story. So what were some of the challenges as you're trying to get comfortable in walking in Herbert's shoes? Man, um, well, actually, I guess one of the main challenges is that I was working on another film at the exact same time. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I was Which playing. Which one was that? Uh, this film called Bull. Okay. I was yeah, playing yeah. A, a black cowboy bull rider uh, in Houston, Texas. Um, and I basically had carved out a week to sh come up to Atlanta to mm -hmm. spend four days on this set. So you think that I have this beard from the other character <laughs> and beards aren't allowed no, on death not. row, yeah. you know what I mean? So, you know, the challenges of speaking to different producers about wanting to hold the beard and, you know, things like that. And in my mind, I was so adamant at being uh, um, true to this character, I felt the beard just had to go. It mm -hmm. was no question. I wasn't going to... Uh, give a characterization, I want to give a real person, a real human. And if beards aren't allowed on death row, then it shouldn't be in this movie. So I made the executive decision to let the other uh, production team figure it out. Uh, but right now, I had to honor Herbert Richardson. So that was probably one of the biggest challenges. And then um, we didn't have like live video footage because unfortunately, right. uh, he expired. Um, um, so they had two pictures of him. 
and basically I would just stare into the pictures or stare into his eyes and look at his body language in the pictures and just try to formulate, you know, his mannerisms and his body and uh, the tone of his voice, uh, which was also helped by the great script written by Andrew Lanham. Uh, it was full of so much uh, beautiful uh, material that actors love to play. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. when, when it's written so well, it's, it's easier to play because you can just fall in and just go on the journey. And that was one of the uh, beautiful things about the script. It was written well enough that it just informed me as I went. Um, what else, man? Just, just I got with my very first acting coach. Really? Uh, yeah. After all this time, you'd never done that before? I, I never, nope. Wow. Nope. So but why this time? Because... I, you know, in our community, man, the jail culture is, is something that you don't want to play with. Mm -hmm. It's something that you don't want to mimic. Um, you don't want to hit false notes when right. you're, when you're uh, bringing somebody who actually lived this experience to life. You want to invest as much as you possibly can to be as true and honest as you can to give this character some voice. And I felt that for me to feel really secure. And I never worked with Destin Daniel Cretton before yeah. our director. So I felt like for me to get extra prepared, what I needed to do was to go back to my roots of acting. The very first person who taught me uh, how to tap into my instrument, and his name is Keith Johnston. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the artistic director at American Theater of Harlem. Mm -hmm. And so I called him up and asked him to come by, and he came by and I showed him some of the things that I was playing with. Uh, for the character and once he gave me the thumbs up I was just super excited to go down and, and, and show what we had had what we came up with I think that's really cool I think it hits on a couple things like your humility as an actor like just because you've been doing it doesn't mean you're gonna stop learning you gotta oh, keep that going right brother for the <laughs> very first day of this New Year's I went to uh, Susan Batson's uh, mm. New Year's class you know I'm, I love acting class something about just even if I'm not participating just to watch mm. You know what I mean? You can There's always something pure learn. and organic about it. Yeah, man, and and I mean, uh, hum, the the human experience is, is never ending. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, to be able to tap into different mindsets and, and different attitudes, uh, you oftentimes can find that in acting classes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. And I just love. I, I actually I love acting class. I ain't gonna lie. I like it. I like being in them. I like participating, and uh, I participated. Uh, on New Year's Day and got an actual 100 on my scorecard. <laughs> so that was like, yes, I'm starting the New well, Year right. What were you tested on? What were the big things? Well, we had four uh, exercise programs. Uh, one, we actually had to go into some uh, human characteristics of our uh, Trump, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, didn't even want to say his name, but yeah. uh, had to do that exercise, had to do an exercise of uh, getting everybody's attention within 30 seconds, because mm -hmm. how can you get the attention of the industry if you can't get the attention of everybody in this room? Good point. Um, we did an exercise where we took uh, something of our New Year's resolution and turned it into a song, so you had to do that. And then we had a uh, monologue that was written based uh, with the backstory of circumstances that was given to us, and then we had to play that monologue without the script. Without, wow. like, you have to learn it and then go up there and do it with no script in hand. So I got a hundred, and that felt good, yeah, you know. It should. Even though they're talking Oscars and all that stuff around my name and performances, it still felt good getting a hundred in Susan Batson's acting class. That's really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I was like, yes, that felt bad. That was my win. I was like, yes. You're like, there you go. Yeah, man. So when you think about this movie, what did you learn about? death row that you didn't know before or just playing an inmate like that? What kind of surprised you about the system or just criminal justice in general that you didn't really know about? Well, you know, growing up as a black man in America, I, unfortunately, I get a lot of information mm -hmm. about the criminal justice system even when I'm not looking for it, yeah. unfortunately. Um, some of the shocking statistics, uh, one out of every nine persons executed is actually innocent. Mm. Um, the staggering numbers of persons that we have incarcerated and on death row, and for some of the situations, how they even wound up on it, which we know uh, a lot of times is based on um, finances. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, our s criminal justice system is set up that if you're uh, rich and guilty, you're actually more innocent than if you're uh, poor 
and innocent, mm -hmm. you're considered guilty. Right. So we got to do things to change that. Um, um, I learned about the Equal Justice Initiative program that Brian Stevenson has. They have a, a .org actually, EJI.org. E they have a, a list of things that people can start from where they are to get in, involved in the conversation so we can help push the needle towards something more positive uh, in our criminal justice system. Um, man, I just understood that just because you see something wrong with America and its system, and if you want to speak out on it, doesn't make you anti-American at all. It just makes you more American, actually, because you want to stand up and do something morally right mm -hmm. and make it right. So, yeah. Yeah, and it's funny how history reflects on those people where at the time there's a lot of criticism, but in yeah. due time they're actually the ones that we admire and respect. Yeah. I mean, Muhammad Ali certainly falls in that category. Oh, man. Not Max. I mean, there's a ton yeah. of people over the years that have gotten a lot of crap in the moment, but history reflects a lot differently on them now. Of course, and then, you know, the thing, you say the word history, and, and history is something that stops. Yeah. You know, this is really something that continues, it keeps going. This story right here is reflective of late 80s, early 90s, and then today uh, we're in circumstances talking about Herbert Richardson, mm -hmm. where we could potentially go into another full-fledged war. Yeah. Now, you fast forward 10, 15 years from now, how many more Herbert Richardsons will we have to deal with? And will those Herbert Richardsons go off to protect this country, risk their life, and then when they come back, will they have anybody to protect them and mm -hmm. fight for them? Yeah, and their sense of reality is warped based on yeah. their experiences. And that's why PTSD is such a big issue for men and women coming back. Oh, Mental man. health issues are so huge. And, like, this is a perfect story, whereas you go yeah. to war, you don't have the right infrastructure when you get back, and you think things should be one way, and they're actually not that way. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, and hopefully with this film, Just Mercy, uh, it could potentially start the conversation, totally. uh, make, make the uncomfortable conversation comfortable so that we can start moving towards a, a direction of healing. And uh, potentially more movies like this could be made to address these type of issues and topics and, and put them in the theater so that we could uh, actually ask ourselves, are we willing to keep tolerating this kind of injustice? Because mm. anytime you could have a 15-year-old wrongfully accused of, of stealing a book bag and he sits three years in a grown man prison without seeing a trial. Yeah, that's wrong. Khalif Browder, but then when you have somebody that uh, is, is, is driving drunk and mulls over four people, a family of four, and then they get off because they were accused of affluenza, meaning mm -hmm. that they were too rich to understand what they were doing. That's a problem. Something ain't right. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I absolutely and, do, and, yeah. And I, I commend Warner Brothers for having the chutzpah to even do this movie. Yeah, because this is a great movie, but still, like you've talked about it before, like these films are not getting made in the yeah. same way. I mean, Last Black Man in San Francisco is another oh, one where it's like <laughs> Sundance is all about it, but even still, like the journey a movie takes like that. So why don't we talk about that film? Like what was the yeah. coolest part of that experience for you? Man, you know, the coolest part of that film and this one also, one is it was so refreshing. Mm to see black men put on screen in a humanistic form, to have humanity, to be laid out with layers, to be seen uh, as uh, other than the stereotypical black male in movies and TV shows. It was so refreshing to be a part of that. I felt like, uh, man, am I a part of a movement right now? Because even with this movie, Just Mercy, you have these three black men, even though they're in jail, mm -hmm. on death row. You see more humanity and grace and brotherhood in these three brothers than you see in a lot of TV shows, in a lot of movies. And these guys are facing death row. It's crazy. And I thought that was just beautiful. You know what I mean? I, I had to be a part of something like that because I think it's long overdue. You know what I mean? It was one particular scene in Last Black Man in San Francisco. You saw it, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil it, but I'm going to spoil it. Where the guy had the tense moment and there was his face off. And any other movie, it would have just been a fight yeah. and been guns yeah. pulled out. And man, when that brother broke down and put his head in, mm -hmm. that, in his shoulder and started crying, that was centuries of healing that needed to be seen on that screen. 
You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. And uh, man, so I commend Joe Talbot, uh, A24, Plan B, Jimmy Fails, all those brothers, that whole gang over there at A24 uh, for Last Black Man in San Francisco. Cause um, yeah, that was a necessary movie also. And I'm glad to be a part of that one too. That's awesome. What about the city of San Francisco? What spoke to you about the city? Cause it's a really fascinating place and obviously so much is going on in this film there. So yeah. what was most interesting to you about San Fran? Man, San Francisco, imagine uh, getting dropped in the Tenderloin. Mm. Are you familiar with the Tenderloin? I'm not, no. The Tenderloin, if somebody was to say that the creator of The Walking Dead mm. said, I went to the Tenderloin and hung out for 15 minutes and I got the idea for The Walking Dead, I'd understand exactly what they were talking about. Okay. To describe what I'm trying to say is that it was such a large population of drug dependent uh, uh, ment like like mental health issue population in this one part of San Francisco to, called the Tenderloin that it was it was it was unnerving in a way and I'm a cat coming from like southeast DC and and grew up in in northern Virginia and, and Brooklyn New York yeah, you've seen some things I've seen yeah, some things absolutely. you know what I mean and to go there and see that I literally saw like uh, five people prepare their syringe needles mm -hmm. right there in broad daylight like no problem so I'm walking down the street preparing their their uh, crack valves with no problem and then I thought but San Francisco has the most billionaires in its city than any place in the world. One out of every 11,000 people in San Francisco is a billionaire. Crazy. So how is it this big, large gap of disparity between the haves and the have-nots? How is that? I mean, and then when you look at their faces, these are some people, man, look just like, mm -hmm. man, look like a brother that maybe just got off stage from jamming, sure. had a hard night, and just boom. Next day, he's out there on that street. I mean, it was like young, old, black, white, Asian. It was everybody right there in San Francisco and Tenderloin for that one particular spot. Then you go out, man, and you taste some of the most amazing food. You mm. see some of the most beautiful architecture. You see some of the most beautiful homes. Amazing spot. Amazing spot, you know. and. And uh, it, I was looking for that 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 rice saroni, a San Francisco <laughs> treat. You know what I mean? But, but I didn't really get that. No, you didn't like, find it. <laughs> no. Next time, right? Yeah. They was like, hey man, that was a commercial in the '80s, man. This is 2000. It's like it's a little different. <laughs> different now, yeah. But uh, I loved it. I had a great time there. But it was definitely eye-opening to mm. see the. Uh, the disparity between the haves and the have-nots. Yeah, I feel you. Why don't we change course here? Why don't we talk about Stranger Things? Because oh, yeah. that's been a fun ride for you. And, and something that I would imagine, like, you thought it'd be a cool role, but it's it's blown up into this whole phenomenon. So, like, what were your initial thoughts about it? And mm -hmm. what's been the craziest part of the roller coaster? You know, uh, the initial thoughts about Stranger Things, some of us on set was running around thinking that this was a, an advanced web series at first, you know. <laughs> oh, definitely, oh, you know. Like, okay. this is cute, right? Yeah, this is cute, you know, <laughs> let's do this advanced web series, right. you know, and, but we, we did it with our hearts and our passions and uh, we loved the characters and the stories and, and, and put it out there, man. And that first season was like, wake up in the morning like, Huh? <laughs> like what? Like wait, people saw it. People saw it. Like oh my, you know. And and it, I think the beauty about that project is that it resonates with so big of a market. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You have the cats from the '80s that was there and lived it, that is grown up now. Yep. And then you have their kids that's impressed with the '80s. They want to learn about the they '80s culture. They want to learn about the yep. '80s culture. And then you have people bringing back. So yeah, man, I think that was uh, just a perfect timing. That, that project, Stranger Things. That's and really uh, cool. Officer Powell, I had fun playing him uh, with David Harbour as our lead mm -hmm. and chief, and uh, uh, John Reynolds as my sidekick. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, we had, we had a great time. That's awesome. So that's one that's cut through. Give me an example of something you've done that you thought would be bigger that didn't become a thing. Like, I'm sure there's a few of those along the way. That well. didn't become a thing? Yeah, like something that you thought, this is a great movie, I really enjoy this part, but it just, didn't become a huge hit like I thought it would. Oh man, uh, you know, that's DJ, that's kind of hard for me, man, because I feel like after I do it and it's out there, it's a hit because we won by just doing it. Mm. 
You so know that's I mean? perspective. Yeah, I get yeah, that. Yeah, like, like uh, I'm, I'm thankful to be uh, selected to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, a lot of brothers and sisters that look like me, unfortunately, don't have the opportunities to play in these projects. Sure. And for me to be a guy that gets to play in the projects and over and over and get excited and invited to other projects, I, I think they all won, you know what I mean? Um, I try Consistency to be, is a win in and of yeah, itself. Yeah, bro. Like, I try to be selective with the roles that I do pick, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So that even if it, it doesn't uh, get the massive attention and respect, at least I could feel good about what I did, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I don't really, because that's opinions, sure. you know what I mean? Because I could be super excited about this project called It's Bruno. Mm -hmm. You know, we did a project, have you, are you familiar with It's Bruno? I've heard about it a little bit. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about see, it? See, now I'm disappointed because I don't feel like <laughs> it was successful because you ain't see it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I feel you. But that was just a uh, brother named Solvin Naeem and I and a bunch of other cats from Brooklyn, man, had this idea around him and his dogs that he has, hmm. you know what I mean? And so I'm kind of like his uh, arch nemesis with my group of dogs. So I we're like, like dog walkers <laughs> competing. <laughs> and it's a it's a uh, real short form, uh, Emmy nominated uh, show I on Netflix. So yes. I can't even talk because it was Emmy nominated. So <laughs> was that a failure, you know? No, I don't exactly. think so. But that's the amazing thing is there's so much stuff out there, yeah. even something that's Emmy nominated. And some people may not touch it. May not touch and it. That's kind of the nature of the world that we're living in right now. Yeah, but you know what's funny is a lot of people recognize me more from that than Stranger Things sometimes. Mm. You know what I mean? Yo, you the guy from Miss Bruno? <laughs> Yo, it's Bruno. <laughs> Down. <laughs> Roll over. You know, they come and imitate your lines and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, that's success to me, man. When you can put something out there and if, if it can resonate with just one person. Mm. You know what I mean? You, you're not going to always win over the... the entire beehive mm. but if I can get one person to say man I saw myself in that you know what I mean I know somebody like that that's a win for me man. totally you're somebody that's put a ton of work into your craft you've done this for many years are there people you've worked with that it's been really special like a little bit extra given the circumstances is there anybody that comes to mind for you anybody that comes to mind off the top of my head Tashina Arnold mm -hmm. uh, and the last black yeah. man of San Francisco uh, She's a phenomenal woman, learned so much with her doing the press tour, just watching her. Like, what do you pick up from her? What are some things you learned from her? Tashina is always, like, on. Mm. You know what I mean? When that camera hits, she's ready to go. She's just ready to go. It ain't no, like, I'm tired. It ain't no, like, you know, give me a second. Boom, mm. she's ready, right? Showtime, let's make it look easy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, learned a lot from Tom Hanks, man. Yeah, Tom that's the new one coming out, right? Worked on Greyhound. Uh, for Tom to embrace me the way that he did uh, was just mind blowing, you know, because here's this A lister that's been an A lister for 20 plus years, and then he come up to you and say, hey, man, I'm a fan of your work. You know what I mean? To show that kind of humility cool. yeah. was just so beautiful. And then when I see him, like, even if I don't recognize him in the room, he'll call my name, like, oh, Tom, <laughs> wow, you know, because uh, it, it just shows that, you know, you could always still remain who you are, mm. you know what I mean? You could always still be a genuine human being, even when you're perceived as this this global, you know, mega star. you can still be you, human. It's refreshing. It's yeah. very refreshing. Learning from Tim Blake Nelson, mm -hmm. hanging out with him on these uh, promo tours, man. Uh, we actually have kind of like a little competition because he beats me to the spot. I'm like, really? God <laughs> damn. Ooh, and he has a family, he has a wife and three kids, and you still get here before me? Oh, but then when I get there before him, I'm like, yes, You're like, what's up, Tim? Yes. Yep, you know, I got you down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's that's a brother that's one of the best character actors of, of our time. Yeah. You know what I mean? See him in The Watchmen, killing it right mm, now to awesome this day, friend. man. Yeah. And, and he still is about his business. And I love being around people like that and learning from people like that. Uh, Lee Daniels, just mm -hmm. worked with Lee yeah. Daniels on uh, this film, uh, Billy Holiday mm -hmm. uh, versus the United States of America. And to see how he is just so honest and pure into the voice of what he really sees the characters and the moments to be. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like really getting to the grit of the moment. Uh, man, beautiful learning from him on that. Um, always my very first acting teacher 
uh, Keith Johnston, you know. It's cool you still have that relationship. Oh, that man. That's really wonderful. Yeah, man. Uh, I still reach out to the brother every now and then. He'll bring a guitar by, you know. He teaches me that your art isn't just about this one lane. Broaden it. Yeah, have you range. Know, have yeah. range, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It ain't like the actor that just wants to act it. Oh, I can't do nothing but act and act and act. No, you'll burn out. you burn out yeah. one. You're not really opening up your instrument and your mind right. and your creativity and your imagination to other things, you know what I mean? So I have a, a guitars that I just fumble around with, even though I don't know how to play them. But I, I pick them up and go on YouTube and <laughs> try to pick little stuff up, you know what I mean? I love it. Yeah, man, paint, you know, still paint every now and then. Um, who else? I mean, I, I mean, man, everybody that's able to get up and do this consistently, mm -hmm. even people who I haven't met, you know, inspiring. Yeah, I'm sure it's inspiring because you know how difficult it is. Like, like M Michelle Obama. Sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. With I mean, her. What an incredible story she's had. Oh, right? great uh, story! And also how she's pushing the uh, further education yeah. initiative in our in our community. And I thought, well, hey, Michelle, you know what? I'll help by wearing my Virginia State University sweatshirt. There you go, loud which, and proud. Loud and proud, yeah. which is the school that saved my life. Mm. You know what I mean? So how did it save your life? Oh, man, because, uh, man, honestly, if I can be transparent, I was sure. a young kid coming up in the streets mm -hmm. thinking that that's all I was uh, worthy mm -hmm. of, trying to make a, a dollar. And uh, by the grace of God, uh, a night happened where uh, I got exposed, and the only thing that I felt that I needed to do was get out of the neighborhood. And uh, when I went to high school that next morning and asked my guidance counselor, how can I get out of this? What can I do? She told me Virginia State University was the only school that would accept me mm. because they had an open door policy. Wow. So that means anybody and everybody could come. And I know it was meant for me because I actually made it in the very last year that they had the open door policy. No kidding. So that, if that's I'd have amazing. Been one year later, I wouldn't have been able to make it. That's not an accident right there. It's not a coincidence. Yeah, and I don't know where I would have been if, if uh, this school would not have accepted me. And just, just the idea of being accepted, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, man. So, yeah, this school, I, I owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the school. Well, I'm glad it worked out this way. Me too, brother. <laughs> me too. The, the streets is cold, yeah, man. man. It's cold, and bro. And eventually uh, luck runs out on the streets. And very much so. And, you know, I don't get to meet interesting and cool people like you like this. Well, man. it's so, been a pleasure, man. Thanks oh, so my much. Pleasure, DJ. Check Thank this you. guy out. Just Mercy in theaters Friday everywhere. Rob, <laughs> I'm DJ. We'll see you next time. Here on yeah. the sit down.